happy Friday to you. This is Omar Serrato, joined by Eliana Rosa on the Tilted Lawyer podcast. Uh, Dominic, producer extraordinaire, is uh, loitering in the background, uh, giving us uh, creepy stares off in the distance as he uh, navigates the ether. Um, folks, I have an amazing show for you planned today. Um, we are going to talk about Robert Tayas. Um, his trial has just concluded. And I saw, I witnessed in that trial, one of the greatest cross-examinations um, that I've seen in recent years. But I can't take my eyes off of this case, the little Madeline Soto. Um, as many of you know, um, I am a certified girl dad. <laughs> 18, four, five, um, all of the women in my life. I'm just, I'm so uh, driven to this case. And I want to make sure that this little girl uh, gets the justice that she requires. And so we're going to go over some of the most recent evidence that's come out. Uh, the police department has most recently released an 80 page PDF. I'm not going to go page through page, but it's a lot of supplemental police reports that kind of paints the picture of what led them to arresting Mr. Stearns. I hesitate to call him Mr. Stearns. Um, they arrested Stearns. And they have also released via FOIA request, uh, courtesy of Grizzly True Crimes, the audio from the interviews where Stearns was interviewed by law enforcement and gave his fumbling, uh, rambling interviews to law enforcement, um, trying to make sense of his story about how he visited a vape shop and then some comic book store and then was kind of driving around and hanging out. Um, all the while, uh, they knew already during those interviews um, because they had seen surveillance uh, footage about where he actually was. And so we'll get into some of that. But more importantly, as he's charged with first degree murder, we struggled on the last show that we did about this a couple of weeks ago, where we had to come up with a motive that would justify first degree. I know there's other ways to get to it, but I, I think that we can, we can justify first degree via motive in this case if we were allowed to introduce all of the evidence that was found on his cell phone, I'm talking about thousands of images and videos of CP, um, the likes of something disgusting straight out of your worst nightmares. Um, all of that has to come in. The fence is trying to keep that out because obviously it's going to be prejudicial. But I think that you need it because it paints a picture that leads to a motive that justifies first degree, which gets this guy the death penalty, which is what he deserves. There should be no plea deal in this one. This is one of those cases where if I was a DA, there's not going to be a plea. We're taking this to trial and you can find us if you want to. Matter of fact, we're looking forward to it. Uh, do your best, uh, but we're going to trial and we're going for the death penalty. And he could talk about at his sentencing hearing about how, oh, I had it so hard growing up and I was neglected as a kid and I was uh, didn't pay attention to me and I had all of these things and I had ADHD. He says that like 80 times during his interview. Um, if that guy, and at any rate, um, we got a lot to get to. In addition to all of that, myself and Ileana are uniquely suited to talk about this case with this respect that we often deal in cases that involve children of Madeline's age, of similar allegations uh, of which are in inherent in this case. And um, what was disturbing to me is not only do we have some of the interviews from Stearns, but of Madeline's teachers friends, neighbors, um, who had an opportunity to observe Madeline up to the final days. And what did they miss? And what was Madeline saying to them that didn't offer up any red flags uh, to justify perhaps a deeper investigation that might have saved her life? Um, it's, there's many layers to it. And I want to talk about it because I think it deserves a discussion. And um, you know what? Let's just, let's just get into it. Whatever you might be going through and wherever you might be, this is Omar Serrato with the Tilted Lawyer Podcast. I'm here to take your mind off of things. Yes, I'm an attorney. No, I'm not giving you legal advice. I want to sit and talk like people as these are the candid thoughts of one practicing attorney and it's after hours. So have a seat. Feel free to have a drink and join me. Let's get started. All right, folks. Um, so I just wanted to go over some of the most recent developments with respect to the timeline as it stands about a couple of days ago since the big uh, press release 
from uh, the, the police department in the context of their investigation. So this is an article out of People, and uh, we're going to go through it together before we get to some of the interviews. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to play the entire interview. A lot of it is just redundant stuff that we already know. We know that he gave Stearns, that he gave an account about what happened. He claims that he dropped. We, we know that <coughs> Stearns gave a, um, he claimed that he had dropped off uh, Madeline at school that day that he wanted to get her McDonald's, but she didn't want to get McDonald's. And he claims that he just dropped her off um, down the block because he didn't want, she didn't want to be seen in his, uh, what he termed it as a hoopty. Um, he has lots of uh, quirks in his language like that. He had, he, he says he had a shitty car. Madeline was embarrassed by him. And so that was the reasoning that he gave to justify dropping her off a block from school. Um, and claims that he went to go to a vape shop like at 10 o'clock, except it was closed and he circles back and then he goes to a comic book store to get this, uh, pick up some, I guess this game that was similar to Pokemon. It's like a playing cards game. The guy's 37 years old. Mm -hmm. Um, by the way, um, of all the comments, I was flabbergasted by one and I'm, I, I don't remember where it was to, to, um, display it on the screen, but there was this one guy that was really offended because we, uh, stated that Stearns was this guy that was trolling vape shops and comic book stores during the day on a school day, on a work day or whatever, uh, with nothing better to do. And what was this guy? And we had even offered like, oh, maybe it was his day off. Maybe it was, you know, he works on the weekends. He has like Mondays and Tuesdays off or whatever um, and offered that. But he was so offended by how I had characterized him. He said that I was being amateurish, uh, to which I say, um, if you really think that my characterization of Stearns was an indictment perhaps on you because you don't have a job and you are of a similar ilk to be trolling vape shops and comic book stores on work days with nothing better to do uh, than to peruse around high schools and elementary schools or whatever it is that you're doing. Um, if you think that is such a front and my stating that is an act of immaturity, then let me just double up on that. Suck my dick, you nerdy, geeky, virgin bitch. All right, because I just don't have any time for anybody that's going to be defending this guy Stearns. And if I'm going to have a conversation about the red flags that were around in this case, and you have a guy such as this that's in and out of the family home um, for a number of years uh, that has been, um, by all accounts, abusing this girl relentlessly for a period of years, and you're going to take offense to something like that out of all the things that you could have taken offense about, out of all of the issues that we discussed on that show, if that's the one takeaway that you have on that, then you're welcome uh, to, see yourself, to see yourself off stage right, because this is not the place for you. Um, but for, for what it's worth, if you're dating a guy that is doing those kinds of things, and inviting him to share the same bed as your 13 year old daughter, which is what Jen Soto was alleged to have done, not alleged. She said that to the cops. Um, and we have re there when we were playing the audio from that show. I don't think you were. I, I think don't we think so. I don't remember that part. I just remember the initial interviews of mother that she was just acting weird. And that the guy was like walking past and, and we, behind. Uh, yeah. We that's what we ha we went over some of the audio of the interview that she gave to the police. And mm -hmm. one of the things that came out of her mouth was uh, she needed to get a rest. And so she told her boyfriend Stearns uh, to go leave her alone and go mm -hmm. sleep upstairs with her 13 year old daughter, which so happened to coincide with the last night of her life uh, because the following day she was reported missing discovered to be have been deceased a short time thereafter a couple of days later um or a short time after Stearns was arrested uh, for the murder of her daughter and then we were talking about it i think lauren was on the show with me bruce was on the show with me it goatee brad was on the show with me um under what circumstance Ileana, would you mm -hmm. as a mother mm -hmm. tell your husband or your boyfriend or whoever a, co a cousin a family member your brother to go share a bed with your 13-year-old prepubescent daughter. There's no way. I, I can't think of a scenario that that is acceptable, like, at all. There's boundaries. Mm -hmm. There's boundaries, you know. Um, my daughters, four and five years old, I had them sleeping in their own room at mm -hmm. about six months. 
Y'all got your room. I mean, the parents' room, separation of church and state, man. There's boundaries, you know, like we're not locking them out of the room or anything, but they got to have their own space. The parents have their own space. Under no circumstances do we share a space, especially when there's like multiple bedrooms in the house. And if the only options was if my wife was kicking me out of the room for whatever reason, um, you know, the couch, I'll go sleep in the man cave. I'll go sleep in the car. I will sleep in a million different places before I share a bed with any of my daughters. There's no way that's happening. Um, I, I don't know. Before I get too far off track. And he wasn't even the father. He was a stepfather. So He, was, he wasn't Wait. even stepfather. He was just boyfriend. Boyfriend, I get it. That's just so, so much worse. Like with the father, I can understand until a certain age. Uh, with a stepfather or any other type of uh, family member, it's just a big no. <laughs> Miss T says, I'm a single mom. My kids have never met one of my male friends, let, let alone yeah. share a bet. Yeah, come on. Come on, man. That's just, that. that is so beyond the pale for me. I, just, I don't get it. The Crow says, that is a mouth drop. I would have loved to see the detective's face. You couldn't see the detective's face, but you could kind of hear the uh, inward gasp. It's like, seriously? Really? Mm -hmm. Um, but Jen was talking about it as if it was just like no big deal. It was nothing to sleep. Well, what do you mean? It's normal. We got, she's got a bed up there. Why not have him sleep in? You know, I needed to get my sleep. I got this new job. It's been speculated that perhaps because of the level of abuse that make no mistake about this. I know that there's a lot of stuff out there floating around about what these ladies have gone through. Um, we already know what happened to Madeline. I don't know what Jen was going through to what extent she was either being abused or that she was complicit in what was going on. I just know. I, ju I just know that for, for right, for right now, for what we have, when you have a guy that is okay with sharing a bed with a 13 year old girl, who's prepubescent going through puberty and all these other things. Um, I, I, I just cannot logically justify that. I cannot. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you what else. It's been speculated, and I'm, I'm, I'm loath to admit, but I feel like this might be the case. I feel like rather than Jen telling Stephen to go share a bed with her daughter, I feel like it's possible that it might have been the other way around. That it might have been, oh, because Jen needs some sleep. Jen should go up into the guest bedroom and then Madeline could come share their bed and sleep that way. So she has more privacy and then he did whatever they did in their room. I don't know if that's going to come out or not, but it's been speculated. Uh, Grizzly mm -hmm. True Crime said that. I've also heard it in other places. It's plausible. Um, I don't know. It's hard to, I'll, I'll tell you what, in all of Jen's interviews, mm -hmm. the percentage of stuff that was made up or the percentage of stuff that was basically a script that she was trying to remember versus actual truth. I'm not sure what the ratio is, but I'd imagine it's pretty small. And so when she's saying stuff to the cops and not thinking anything of it, like, Oh, it's not no big deal. It's just, you know, I told, I told Steven to go sleep up there with, uh, with Madeline. Is it possible that she was told by Steven to say that to justify in the event that it ever came out, that uh, so why were you sharing a bed? Because maybe there was pictures or images that it was a word of them uncovering. Maybe that was going to be his way to justify. Well, yeah, it was normal because she told me to go up there, and so hey, it was her house, and so I just went along with it. Because it just the way that she said it, and, and the way that it came out, it just didn't feel like she was connected to the words. You, you know what I'm saying? Like it didn't feel like it was something that was coming from um, her as if she was telling the cops what happened. Mm -hmm. It was almost as if she was reciting something that she had remembered. And in the course of remembering it and reciting, it was almost as if she was reading it without really comprehending what she was saying. Now I say that, but we've also speculated that in every single interview, it like appears that she's on Valium or some kind of a, a, a mood pill or some kind of depression medication or some kind of medication. So it's, it's hard to decipher all of that. All I'm saying is there is a world 
where Stearns, the level of abuse was so um, prevalent that mm-hmm. it extended into Jen and the responses that she gave to law enforcement. And the only, I'll tell you what, it just came out this, this past week that they're not charging Jen with anything. Anything, nothing. Nothing, not failure to protect, not child endangerment, nothing. The only world that that makes sense to me is if they know something that we don't know that hasn't been released to the public yet about some of the abuse that might have been perpetrated upon Jen in conjunction with Madeline. What do you think about that? I mean, I mean, the only, I don't know, because even in cases where the other parent is the victim, still, they I have seen cases where they are charged like it's just yeah well we live in california california is pretty trigger happy when it comes to that yeah. so most of our point of reference is that but i could and rachel brings up a good point she says so far yeah she hasn't been charged so far mm-hmm. um, but it, it came out and just basically said she's not being charged with anything she's no she's not i don't know if they can't went so far as to say she's not a suspect or under investigation or whatever. I just know as of right now, there's nothing to charge her with. And I wonder if that's because of some bombshell that's going to drop about Mm -hmm. the the, uh, years of horrific abuse that was perpetrated on the two of them. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, It's incongruous with the facts from what is known. I'll tell you that much, but let me get into some of this. Oh, I lost my page. Uh, article. So this is where we're at so far with the timelines. Uh, this is from people.com. Mm-hmm. Um, they have just determined a cause of death for young Madeline. Um, authorities mm-hmm. have released the cause of death for 13 year old Madeline Soto, whose disappearance prompted the arrest of her mother's boyfriend earlier this year. Soto was found dead in a wooded area on March 1st, days after she was reported missing on February 26th from her Kissimmee, Florida home the Orange County Sheriff's Office previously said. A medical examiner has now ruled the matter of her death as homicide and determined she died as a result of strangulation. Um, Before her body was found, and while investigating her disappearance, police arrested her mother's boyfriend, Stephen Stearns, 37 years old, on charges of sexual battery and possession of child sexual abuse material, the Sheriff's Office said. He was not facing these charges in connection with the teenager's disappearance, but police said they considered him a prime suspect in the case. In April, Stearns was charged with first-degree murder in connection with Soto's death. Now, there has been, I've been trying to wrap my head around how they're going to get to first-degree murder. I know that they're going to say, oh, well, murder in conjunction with a felony and all of that. But... I don't think that that's what you want to rely on. I think if you're going first degree murder in this case, I think you want to, I think you just want the full on premeditation. Mm-hmm. And if you have like all of these years of CP that they found on his phone, mm-hmm. I think it lends itself to a verdict of premeditation. I think it lends itself to a motive um, where it started off as a, a, maybe an infatuation because he has this sick proclivity uh, for being attracted to children and then it escalates and then it escalates and then it escalates and then you're going to hear as he describes um the final days his final day with Mm -hmm. madeline um that he describes her a certain way and then over and over and over again he starts saying that she was embarrassed by me she was embarrassed by my car um you know she thought you know whatever he starts saying those kinds of things and then he he mentions just haphazardly that she was mentioning her crushes, you know? Um, And it got me thinking. I don't think out of all the times that I've ever had talks with my daughter about boys that I've Mm -hmm. ever repeated anything like that to anybody. Mm -hmm. Law enforcement, obviously, but not like other family members, not like my grandma, my grandma, my uh, my mom, um, not anybody like that. It just would not be top of mind. You know, to to mention that in conjunction with her being going missing, you know, unless he was trying to get at, well, maybe she ran off with a boy, which he never went there. Like in all of the interviews, and there's like an hour, 15 minutes or so of him talking to the cops, 
It was all him trying to recount his story that he initially said about him misdirecting the cops about why he was in certain places at certain times, trying to um, reconcile certain gaps in his timeline. But it was never like, uh, oh, yeah, she ran away with her friend or whatever or with a boy. It was never anything like that. It was just like she had ADHD, lost her home. I don't know what happened. It sucks that she's gone. He keeps well, on saying that over and over. If you put the two together, it almost sounds as if he's jealous. Like she's yep. like she's uh pretty much saying all the things that she doesn't like about me, and then at the same time she's going all with all these or talking about all these boys. It's just very strange. <laughs> well, I'm I'm reading from the chats. I mean, they're all of the same mind. Um, raw, raw baby says maybe she became too old for him and was going to tell now that he, she was interested in boys. That's one aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Because what always happens is that children have a tendency to get older and develop very adult, um, logical skills, um, where whatever horrors that he perpetrated on her as a child that he hoped to keep under wraps were so severe that that wasn't going to stay under wraps for very long, especially when she starts dating. Um, but the other aspect of it, uh, like Miss T says, I'm really thinking it has to do with jealousy. Maybe he was jealous. Mm -hmm. Think about this guy's profile. Here's what we know about him. He, he, he's trolling vape shops at 10 a.m. on a work day, which no big deal. If he vape, whatever, fine. Mm -hmm. But he's going to comic book stores and he's like uh, in, engaging in these Pokemon card games. That's not something typically you would find of a 37 year old man to do. Um, his voice is very childlike his mannerisms are very childlike his vocabulary is very childlike he he has the vocabulary of like a 13 year old if you hear him talk and you're going to hear him talk for a little bit um, he's very childlike despite him being this 37 year old man and so it's conceivable to me that in the course of him um finding out about some crush that he became so enraged and jealous that he decided to take her life and she was strangled. And so, I don't know. Uh, Pam says, thank you so much for the five, Pam. Um, thank you so much for the kind words in the discord. I really appreciate you. I really, really do. Um, Pam says, one of the tenants texted JS, are you okay with MS sleeping with your boyfriend? JS said in her reply, thank you. Um, so others made it apparent it was wrong. JS said in her reply, thank you. Yes. Yeah. That is another layer to it, isn't it? Under what world would is she just let off the hook? I can't imagine that the investigation into her is over. I just can't. Uh -uh. You can't just like nonchalantly just say that, oh, yeah, my, my 13 year old daughter is sleeping with my boyfriend, even if you mean it in, the, in a platonic way. You can't say that to normal adults and like, what? What are you talking about? Are you, what do you mean? If, if my sister were to say something to me like that, mm -hmm. like, what are you talking about? Like in the same bed? Why? Mm -hmm. Like there would be questions, but it would be pretty clear that that's not a normal course of events that a grown man would sleep in the same bed with a 13 year old girl for any reason, any reason. Um, I'll tell you what, my firstborn Raven, um, she did not want to sleep in her own bed. I made the mistake when I was a parent, a very young parent um, of letting her sleep in the bed with me. And so when we got her her own room, um, she didn't want to sleep in her bed because she was scared of the dark or whatever. And so she just, it became a habit, you know, one, two, three, four, five, seven, year, six years old. Um, and then at some point, it's like, hey, you have to sleep in your room. But dad, I'm scared of the dark. I want to sleep in the bed with you. He's like, nope, nope, I'm right here. Look, just knock on the knock on the door or the door, knock on the knock on the wall um, and I'll knock back. But you have to set up those boundaries and it's best to do it like before they're able to talk. So they're just used to it. Mm -hmm. um but yeah at 13 years old that's just a little bit much man that's a bit if you have the means um unless you're you know impoverished somehow um there's not a a, a scenario where it's normal for grown mm -hmm. folks to do that um sabrina winchito 
says she knew it was wrong. She literally called him over because her daughter had turned 13 and three. And even though he had not been there for months, she invited him over to sleep with her kid. F her and him. Saltina, I'm with you. Mm -hmm. I'm with you on that. Now, I don't know the specifics, but my antennas have been up for Jen Soto since I learned about this case. And um, just because she's not charged with anything right now doesn't mean she's never going to be charged with anything. Mm -hmm. Let's get further into this. So let's go into some of the audio. And I'll share this with you guys. And again, this is from Grizzly True Crimes. If you want to listen to the full unadulterated audio without commentary, I highly recommend uh, Grizzly True Crimes. She um, has gone out of her way and spent her own money and resources to accumulate these this audio um, via FOIA requests. And so go ahead. If you haven't done so already, give her a subscribe. Um, when it comes to true crime stuff, I got to tell you, man, like there's a there's like a top five. Definitely. Um, I know that Annie Elise is really good, but in my mind, if you just want the unadulterated truth facts with these true crimes cases, it doesn't really get much better than Grizzly True Crimes. She deserves to have over a million subscribers. Um, at any rate, let me get in with this. So I'm going to start this about six minutes in, and we're going to listen to about maybe five or seven minutes of this audio. And this is Stephen. Uh, talking about him dropping Madeline off at school, and then he's going to start describing um, their last days or his last days with her. And it's just exceedingly odd. Sharon Cloette, thank you for a what is a czar? Czar 70? Um, thank you for czar 70. I'm not sure how much it is. Um, but thank you so much. You're amazing. And um, I appreciate you so much. It's the crazy. Yeah. African currency. Is it African? Oh, it's like like Zaire? Oh, I don't know how it's uh like the correct the correct way to say it, but I just Google star currency and it's it's just South African currency. So oh, <laughs> instead I of dollars. <laughs> I gotcha. Okay. Let me go to six forty six. Um is my is my screen shared? Yeah, let's uh, let's go ahead and listen to this and let's uh, see what we think. That's fine. Do you remember what you did after? Uh, yeah, I, I, after I left her, um, you know, I was watching her in her rearview. When you're listening to this, Alien, I want you to I want you to give me your opinion about what you think about Stern's voice, his inflections, his okay. choice of vocabulary, and uh, I want to see if you agree with my. Um, criminal profile of him. We are just driving away. She looked like she was making her way towards the school like normal. So mm -hmm. I went on with my day, went over to the vape shop nearby. Um, they were not open yet. Uh, so I came back home, hung out for a little while with Jen. Um, and then after about an hour, I went to check the vape shop again and they were open. So I took care of my stuff there and it became a normal day. Okay. So just to go through your, I asked Jennifer the same question. What's the temperature like in Florida? Like around this time of year, around February, beginning of March? Horrible. Is it yeah. like hot, humid? I'm, I'm saying that because this guy's like wearing a beanie. And, um, you know, I don't know if, uh, if that's a, a vanity thing, but it's just the guy's manner of dress is odd. Look at this guy. He's like wearing sandals. I'm not one to judge anybody on fashion. I'm really not. I'm the last guy to do that. All I'm saying is that his manner of dress is odd. Questions just to go through everyone's days, but just to go through yours. So you dropped her off at school and you said you went to the vape shop. Correct. They weren't open. Correct. Do you remember about what time you got home? Uh, got home around maybe quarter after 10. Gotcha. And was she, was Jennifer here? Yeah, Jen was here. Uh, she had been sleeping in. Uh, her new work schedule has, has had her kind of messed up, so she was trying to sleep in as much as possible. Gotcha. So when you got back around 10? Uh, she was just, she waking, was just up. waking up. Yeah. Uh, so we hung out for a little while, chit-chatted, then I went and checked the vape shop again, got my stuff, came home again, uh, hung out for a little while. We talked about maybe, you know, doing some DJ shopping or something after we picked up 
by the way, I, I can't do anything about that hum in the background. It's just going to be there um, ubiquitously during the course of this audio. And uh, then she wanted to take a nap again. Uh, I had a couple of errands I needed to run, so that worked out fine. Sorry. I wanted to check out a couple of the card game shops in the area. Oh, one of my trading card games just had a new, new release. I just wanted to look at stuff. Ended up getting a flat tire. Okay. Uh, so that's one of my hoopies on a hoop. Oh, where'd you now. get a flower? Where'd you get a flat tire? 192. That was hair raising. And that was when you were uh, out shopping during the day. Yeah, yeah. And that that was between between the hours of noon and like two. Okay. Got it. And then so after uh, leave by two thirty to go get get in line and get ready to. So we're not listening to this to uh, ferret out the veracity of his story because we already know that he's um, unabashedly lying about virtually everything in this case. Um, what I'm more interested in is his mannerisms and his, his inflections and uh, what he's saying because I'm trying to, here's what I'm trying to do. If I'm looking at this as a prosecutor, I'm trying to tie in his personality with the kind of guy that would be jealous of a 13-year-old girl having crushes on seventh and eighth graders to coincide with how he's been grooming her for years and sexually <laughs> and how in a fit of jealous rage and perhaps to cover up what was inevitably going to be revealed in the coming days, months, years, or whenever, um, I'm trying to establish a motive. And so when I'm, when I'm listening to this audio as an attorney, I'm not listening into it for the truth. I'm just trying to get any clues whatsoever that I could tie into a motive. Would you agree with that, Eliana? Yeah. More or less? Well, because yeah. we kind of already know the story. I mean, his version of it is bullshit. We got the receipts. We got surveillance. We got Madeline in the car. Um, we got the actual time frames. They had his Google Maps. So when he's saying he went to this vape shop and then he went to the comic book store and gave specific timelines, they knew we didn't because Google Maps doesn't really lie. Funny thing about Google Maps, if you're logged into Google on your phone for like, however, I don't know, um, going back 10 years or however long you've been connected to Google, it has tracked every single drive you've ever made, ever, unless you specifically turn it off. And so one of the things that they did to prove that he was a liar was they said straight up, hey, let me check your Google Maps. Mm -hmm. And so that's how they knew um, exactly uh, to the second where he was when he was given this bullshit story to the cops. Got it. So you guys went and picked her up together? Uh, that was the goal. Yes, I was going to go with them, but I ended up getting a flat tire. So oh, so left. you couldn't. Yeah, I got, I got back literally 10 minutes after she left, apparently. Got it. And so forgive me, I missed something. I, I kind of missed it in the middle of there, but you got back home around 10. You hung out with Jen, mm -hmm. and then you all just kind of hung out. And then... And then did you separate to go shopping or? Uh, she took a nap and then I went and ran my errands. Okay, got it. And then around noon or two o'clock, you is when you got flat tire and she was leaving to pick up. Uh, no, so when when we hung out first, oh. I had gone to the vape shop, which was now open to get my vape, and then came back and oh. hung out more. And then we separated and I did my errands and she took a nap. Got so it. That was okay. around, around noon is when that. Got it. Okay, I just want to make sure I have that straight. So you went back to the vape shop. Which vape shop is it? Where's the uh, vape shop around here? Cigarette online on uh, John Young. Oh, okay, I didn't know there was one around here. Is it e-cigarette, e-smoker, e-something e online? But I've been going to them for a while. I think I remember their name. And you made it out there about what time? So uh, that was probably just after eleven that I finished up there. Okay. Um, got it. Now, can you remember the day prior to Monday? Do you remember? So this is where, honestly, out of all this interview, like a lot of us, you already know, but this, this part specifically, I think is what ties in the most to a possible motive. I mean, I guess if anything happened between Saturday night and Monday, when you were here, that might have sparked wanting to. She was so happy. Okay. Because. Party, right? Yeah, all three of us are together, and she's just so happy. Um, 
tell me about Sunday, Sunday night. Tell me about Sunday into Monday. What you remember? She just had a party. Mm -hmm. She was excited. It's okay. Just talking about crushes. Her singing that was coming out then. Could I could I play that back? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I gotta play that back just because of just how um UTF that was to introduce that crushes into uh, what he's saying she was so happy she talked about crushes the two of those are not connected logically um he asked her to tell me about that night and you know most people most people if they're talking to law enforcement for a missing person and they don't have anything to do with it they're very clinical in their speech mm -hmm. um they're very clinical uh, they're very detached emotionally they're trying to just get out the emotions they're not feigning anything it's like look i just got to get you this information uh, we had a birthday party um, you know, she had a fun day, went to bed, uh, and went to school in the morning. They're giving you very specific information. You're not, what you're not doing is offering any thing about, oh, she had a crush and she was so happy. Like he's, he's talking like it's a, a freaking, um, eulogy or something. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, and this is in the midst of before he was arrested, obviously, um, uh, mm -hmm. before he knew that they knew, uh, that she was gone. It's Okay. about crushes her singing that was coming out then do you want me to come see her sing mm -hmm. nothing bad she was just happy she was very happy so the fact that he says that she wanted him to come see her sing mm -hmm. is unlikely because what I know of that is that she did not like Stearns mm -hmm. very much. When she would describe him to teachers, he was like this guy that would come around and it was kind of weird and he, he ate up all the food is the way that she would describe him. He was not the kind of guy that she would invite to her choir recitals, for example. And she had a biological dad. And so Stearns, through Madeline's lens was just not that guy that she needed to have witness her more uh, public moments that she would have been proud of. But the way that he's describing it as if they had like this friendship or whatever, and she wanted him to be there and they had this good relationship. But before he even gets into any of that, the first thing that he brings up is crushes. I don't know. What does that spell to you, Eliana? So much weirdness. <laughs> I mean, of course, uh, together with what we know already, jealousy, but it's just such a weird statement to make, such a weird thing to bring up, especially in the midst of what's going on. Like, that's how is that important to finding her, trying to learn what happened to her when they were doing this interview? Like, the only way that I could have possibly ever seen that come up, because later on in these interviews, he's talking about how she played Roblox and Minecraft and she would get on, um, I don't mm -hmm. know, like a group speak or internet chat or whatever, and talk with her friends or her cousin while she's playing video games. Mm -hmm. And perhaps, you know, maybe she had designs on running away because she was yeah. going very strangely at one point in this interview, he mentions um, Madeline having PMS. Mm. How does he know that? <laughs> Like, as know. a dad, as, as a dad of a teenager, mm -hmm. I've never, ever described my daughter having PMS. Mm -hmm. I would never, I would never talk about it. I just wouldn't talk. I don't feel comfortable talking about any of this. Go talk to your grandma. <laughs> um, when my daughter first got her menstrual, um, all I did was I knew she needed supplies, and so I went to like the CVS and I got like a bunch of different supplies. And um, like multiple different brands and uh, like pain medication, mm -hmm. like a heating pad for her back um, on my mom's recommendation. Um, <laughs> and just 
here. Uh, call your grandma. She could help you. And that was it. <laughs> but I would never, ever, ever mention to another person about my daughter having PMS for any reason whatsoever. I mean, I can't understand if you're a single dad, you need to learn those things and you would probably have that conversation, especially because some people don't have a grandma or an aunt to True. go to. Yeah. But it's usually by your dad. The fact that he is just a new boyfriend of mom and having that knowledge or like talking about that, it's just very weird. Like, why is he paying attention to that? Why does he know that? It's it's creepy. Yeah. I, I think you're right. If if he was a single dad or any single dad, you gotta I mean you gotta do what you gotta do. I mm -hmm. mean, again, you don't really don't have any female persons there to direct that, then I guess you, you got you have to. Mm -hmm. But like 90% of people have people like that, you know, and he her mom was there. Mm -hmm. So like he was he was so far from a single dad. He wasn't even he wasn't even any kind of a dad. No. He was your mom's boyfriend. He wasn't even stepdad, despite people keep calling him that. He's just some guy that would come around. He's been coming around for a while. He's probably mooching off these people. Um I don't I don't know, man. But the fact that he specifically as a guy that doesn't live there, that is not her bio dad, that is not her stepdad, to even bring that up in the midst of conversation is disgusting. And he knew about that for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. um, let me continue with this. <clears throat> There's nothing out of the ordinary. I can't remember anything particularly happened. I showed her the movie Sister Act. Um, ah, okay. Okay, so let me just paint the picture. In his mind, in his mind, well, from 20,000 feet, she just had a birthday party. Everybody's tired. It's late at night. Um, most teenagers don't want to hang out with their parents past a certain time. And he's talking about like she, he's doing, she's doing rehearsals for him and singing for him. And they're watching the movie Sister Act. Um, how much time do you have in the day to do that? Sister Act? Uh, I don't know. It depends on the first or the second one. That movie's like two hours long. <laughs> and uh, to get a uh, uh, to get a teenager to watch a movie from the 90s. Hey, Dominic, do you know what Sister Act is? I do not know. <laughs> hey, Leona, do you even know what that movie is? Yes, I do remember that movie. Whoopi Goldberg, like in 91, 92, okay. 93, maybe somewhere around. You're asking a teenager to watch a 30 year old movie. Um, like we're past midnight. It's got to be at this point um, around bedtime. It's just, uh, you know, um, let's continue. She was singing so well. I told her she reminded me of the choir. We got their stuff together, started singing better. I wanted to show it. Gotcha. So Sunday night, did y'all, how do you decide like who's going to get her ready for school in the morning and everything? Uh, I take her to school in the morning so she can sleep in as much as possible. Okay. And I agreed. I've done the school run a few times before. It's not usually my forte, but I don't mind helping. And so Jennifer shared with me, typically you normally sleep in the upstairs guest bedroom. Yeah. And then she will sleep together in her own bedroom. Correct. But last night or not last night, Sunday, so Jen could get better sleep. She said she's just sent you both upstairs, correct? Gotcha. Okay. So the way that story just came out, doesn't it seem more realistic that... Um, now, look, this is after mm -hmm. Jen and Stearns had opportunity to coordinate their stories. Mm -hmm. I have to believe that part of the audition was, okay, this is what we're going to say. Uh, you sent me up to go sleep in the bed with Madeline. It, it, it just doesn't make sense. Like she could have, I mean, how disruptive is a teenager for mom sleep? Like I understand a newborn. Well, let me ask but, you this way. Let me ask you this way. What if, what, what do you think, what do you feel is worse? Mm-hmm. For a mom to send her boyfriend to go sleep in the same bed with her 13-year-old daughter, 
or Mm -hmm. for that boyfriend to say, hey, you need to get your sleep. What are all them chimes, man? Um, Or to have uh, you, your boyfriend, tell you, you need to get your sleep, go sleep in Madeline's room. Madeline, come sleep in the bed with me. And then mom allows it to happen. What do you think of those two scenarios is worse? Wait, so the first one is the one that happened. And what was the second one? First one is basically Jen sent Steven to sleep with Madeline. Second one is uh, he sent Jen to go sleep in Madeline's room while Madeline would come sleep in the bed with him. Oh. Mm. Is there even a degree of difference or are those just equally reprehensible? Because I'll accept that answer as well. I mean... I think it's worst that mom, I mean, according to his uh, interview, mom, well, I don't know. I think they're about the same. I, I don't know. Yeah, at, I don't know. It's, 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 at the end, whoever brings it up first, I don't think really matters is who allowed it. Because even if he was the one that made the proposition or suggested it, mom should have said no. And if mom brought it up, which is horrible, um, he, as a grown-up man, should have said, this is not appropriate. So, Yeah, um, like a grown-up man, exactly. Maura, thank you so much for becoming a Tilted member. Um, Maura's been around for like the last month or so, maybe longer. Uh, but thank you so much uh, for joining. Here's Here's my take on it. In what scenario would your husband tell you to get the F out? I need my sleep or you need your sleep. Go sleep in the guest bedroom. Uh, bring uh, our daughter into the bed with me so that you get your rest. How quickly are you going to say, well, I don't know what you're going to say. What are you going to say to that? What would you say to that? Like he gets to stay with. He's kicking you out of the room. He's kicking you out of the master bedroom so you can go sleep in the guest bedroom to have uh, your daughter um, you guys are basically going to trade places for the night. I mean, that has never happened. It just doesn't make sense. I have kicked him out of the room during the day. Okay. So it's plausible to me that maybe she did kick, maybe Jen did kick him out of the room, but yeah. didn't know that he was going to go uh, shack up with Madeline. Like there was four to- bedrooms in that place. Maybe she thought that he was going to take one of the other bedrooms, but my understanding is a couple of those other bedrooms were um, being used by others because they were renting it out. Or maybe she thought he was going to go sleep on a couch somewhere in the living room. Um, and then come to find out that, well, actually, what you're going to tell everybody is that you kicked me out, I let you alone so you can get your rest, and I, you told me to go sleep with Madeline, and so I did. Maybe that was the, uh, the polished version that they came up with together. And because the times that I've done it is where I it's during the day and I know they're going to be like in the living room, just awake and playing. I just need like maybe one or two extra hours of sleep. And like, I, I can even listen to them playing. Like it's not where they're sleeping. Not that I have an issue <laughs> with my husband or anything like that uh, with my daughter, but uh, it's just, it's very different because in Madeline's case, he's not her dad she's a teenager like it's just not appropriate in any way and there was just so many options that she could i don't know send him to sleep in the sofa in the living room um on the floor like i understand she needs her sleep but how disruptive is him for her not to be able to get get the sleep if he's in the same room even if he's on the floor like it doesn't matter if my <laughs> wife would kick me out of the room, um, I'd be like, all right. But if she told me to go sleep with the children, like, no. What? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, man. Uh, it's but that's, it's couch. You know, yeah. let's, tie this, let's tie this in a motive. Let's tie this in a motive. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's carrying on, and the way that he's describing this, what red flags in your mind are popping off the way that he's describing his last night with Madeline? Um, Michael Clover says, give Omar some likes. Yeah, give us some likes. Thanks, mm-hmm. Michael. <laughs> For sure. Um, and, and what? I, I lost my train of thought. But I'll just say like this. From what you just heard in this mm-hmm. audio, and the way that he's describing, and the context being 
that um, he is speaking with law enforcement to figure out how give him information that would lead to Madeline being found because she's gone missing, right? And the way that he's describing it is, oh, she was just so happy. She was talking about crushes. She wanted me to go see her sing in a choir. I showed her the movie Sister Act. Um, How many red flags are popping up in your mind upon listening to all of that? Many. His, what the, the information that he's giving is not helpful at all to find her. It's just it's as if he's giving excuses or trying to paint himself as the good stepfather uh, in the picture. Like I have nothing to do with her disappearance, rather than giving information that will actually lead to finding her. Like who yeah. cares if she was so happy? Who cares if you were invited to go singing? How is that going to help find her? In my opinion, um, whenever you're giving information to law enforcement because mm-hmm. you're trying to aid in the investigation, I can't say it enough. Most of the time, your answers and your responses are very clinical. They're not emotional. Uh, you give more information than you need. You try to think of anything and everything, but you're not talking about emotional states mm-hmm. and the things that are relevant or they ask you about it or it's like is there anything you could think of uh, that she was having some kind of relationship with some other person that she might have ran away not that i could think of but here's her phone um he brings up that she had adhd like 80 times in this interview um let's continue with this and see if we could glean anything else um do you remember about what time you went to bed and woke up Bed, probably 11 quarter after wound up after her party and we were getting up really really early so we could make good time getting out of the door so we got up around seven getting up at seven when school starts like at 8 30 is not getting up really early <laughs> come on man yeah y'all left pretty early yeah okay did you see Jen at all in the morning or was yes. she still asleep? Yeah, I saw her a couple of times. I was in and out of her room talking to her. Got it. Okay. And that was before you left around, what time did you leave? About 8.30? Uh, no, earlier than that, we made such a good time. I mean, we were so impressed. We made such a good time getting out the door. I mean, we were probably out by 7.30, 7.45. Okay. Because uh, we wanted to get McDonald's breakfast. We'd been talking about it anyway, and she ended up not wanting it after all. Got it. Um, she keeps on hearkening back to this um, mm-hmm. story about we're going to get McDonald's, but she didn't want to. But I wanted to try to talk her into it because I was hungry, and then she ultimately didn't want it. He keeps repeating that over and over. Any trouble at all recently at home? No, no, not recently. No arguments that you can remember between. Her and you, anything that's no, upset her? Not for a while. When was the last time? Maybe, maybe a month. You know, typical, you know, mood swing stuff. You know, she, yeah. she has some pretty, pretty bad PMS when she gets it, and uh, being a teenager on top of it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. I don't know. The way that I would ca- categorize my teenager's bad behavior is that she's a teenager. A teenager. Mm-hmm. There- no circumstance would PMS be what I will let lead with. And so I was talking to the doctor and they asked me specifically about it, you know, um, I don't know. I know all about it. Um, now you said she, I think you said she left her phone, right? Yeah. Where did she leave her phone at? Uh, she left it in her room. She's ADHD. So am I for that matter. Right, so you left mom. your phone too, huh? Yeah. By the way, the ADHD thing that comes up, this, that's, that's like a major theme in this guy's story. Not mm-hmm. only does, Madeline have ADHD, but he's got a little bit of ADHD. We all have a little bit of ADHD. He's not saying over and over, but to my mind, correct me if I'm wrong. I feel like if you do genuinely have that, then the one thing that you would not forget or neglect is if you were missing your cell phone. Mm -hmm. Let me, let me explain. Yesterday I was in court Mm -hmm. after I concluded my hearing. I left my cell phone in the courtroom and then they broke for their morning recess. 
So I was standing around for 20, 25 minutes, like just pacing back and forth in between the halls with nothing to do. And I kept reaching for my phone because I was so bored and I just couldn't. Um, A kid that has ADHD is not going to just leave. Mm -mm. I mean, and I'm maybe speaking out of turn. I don't know if that is a symptom or not. I Um, mean, I've heard of kids leaving it, even anything um, at home, ADHD or not. So I mean, it's possible. I know kids tend to be very attached like these days to cell phones. So it's probably yeah. the, one of the things that they misplaced the least, but still. Um, That's prob- you're probably right. I mean, it's it's plausible. Just the fact that he just keeps on saying this is really irking me. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we try to be on top of her about that, not forgetting things, but we're also a bit forgetful too. Got it. Um, but yeah, it's not uncommon for her to forget everything that she, she leave it in her room or you know, she in the she left bedroom it in her room she must have been grabbing her shoes or a hoodie or something and set it down and, and that's just how it goes okay got it do you find it odd that this guy's given like a full play-by-play about how she left her phone which mm-hmm. is basically a tantamount to hearsay evidence or speculation because he has no idea yeah. Um, that he's like providing all of these unnecessary details about how she could plausibly have left her phone as opposed to saying, I don't know if she had a phone with her. I guess she must not have. I don't know why. Mm-hmm. Yes. She's given too many explanations. Definitely. Yeah. Too many very explanation oriented at the time at the, right mm-hmm. now during this interview. Um, gotcha. Is it typical of her, I guess, to forget things like that? Yeah. Very, very typical. Got it. All right, man. Well, I mean, you know her. Uh, you know her better than I do. Is there anything you can think of that, as someone who doesn't know her, that I might be missing out on here? Like somewhere she may like to be, or somewhere she. Everything that we are aware of that we think she could possibly be, we've checked. And I mean, literally, the whole family is just. So you know of the you know that the deputies found the video from the church last night of her in the park which by the way this Mm -hmm. part of the interview was very interesting to me because the surveillance on the church Mm -hmm. did not show madeline soto going into a church Mm -hmm. so at this point i feel like they must have at this point already known or seen the surveillance of madeline deceased in the front seat of the car Mm -hmm. but the fact that he's leading um sterns on to believe that oh we got the surveillance and you know from the church last night in the parking lot as if it's corroborating and perhaps they saw something similar to madeline and going along so he could go along with his lie what do you think of that i mean it's a tactic (laughs) move (laughs) move. by the way man this guy's voice is so infuriating to me this guy infuriates (laughs) me so much his his stupid whiny voice I've never, I've never seen a genuinely innocent person Mm -hmm. relate anything to law enforcement or otherwise um, speak in this very obviously put on uh, whiny, um, overly dramatic, emotional, vocal fry voice. Vocal fry. (laughs) And it's so infuriating to listen to it from this guy. I cannot explain to you. I was ready to do a whole thing on Tayez and I just couldn't because F this guy, man. I want to, I'm, I'm just so, they better not give him this, they, they better not give this guy a plea. I, I, they better take this all the way to trial. Make him defend it, man. Um, <laughs> Jesus with this, all right. They saw someone. So can you think of a reason that she might have gone and waited in that church that's across the street? for a couple minutes before she would have headed back off to school? No. I mean, she she had time to kill, so I don't know. She said she was going to hang out and find her friends, but when I left her, she was on the other side of the street, rummaging through her backpack and just kind of moving towards the, the school area, so it looked normal. What do you think she was looking for? I assume she was just looking for some headphones or something for her walk, but she might have been looking for her actual phone. Got it. Okay. Um, yeah. You see how ridiculous these answers are? 
Um, what do you think she was looking for? I don't know. Maybe she was looking for her cell phone or some headphones or whatever. Um, they're just digging him deeper into this ridiculous hole that he's creating himself for himself. And that's all I can. That's all I can really think of at the moment. So if you listen to the entire audio, there's like an hour and fifteen minutes of it. And there's this female officer that jumps on, and she is very um, suspicious. I mean, she's. You could hear the anger in her voice initially. Uh-huh. And I'm going to play a little bit for you. We're at the end where the like, you know what? Effing, you're 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 full of shit. <laughs> you both know that you're full of shit. And so what's what's with you? And um she goes into this whole thing. Um I'll play just for the pure satisfaction aspect of it. I think I have a phone number for you. Um we had talked about getting McDonald's breakfast beforehand, so we want to make good time. Um we did make good time. We got out the door maybe 730, 745-ish, maybe. Got over to that area. She was asleep in the car most of the time, just snoozing until we got there. We got to McDonald's. We're close to McDonald's. I said, you still want it? Wasn't interested in the McDonald's anymore, so we continued on. And uh, she wanted to be dropped off a little down the ways from the school. Um, she's got this phase that she's been into lately where she's very particular about what car she's seen getting out of in front of the school. Um, she prefers my cars are, I guess, kind of hoopties. Um, I get it. It's an image thing. But um, that was sometime probably between 8.20 and 8.40-ish, somewhere in there. It was along the stretch of the road that um, on the right side that has all the communities on it. Mm-hmm. Before you get to the overpass, you could see the overpass from where it was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this that female voice, that's the female officer that I'm talking about from the very beginning. This is interview number two with law enforcement with him. But she knows that, number one, this guy is guilty as F. Number two, she could hardly hide her disdain for him. And she right now she's trying to be very friendly because she's trying to get as much information as possible. But you can hear uh, the agitation in her voice, the tension in her voice, because she knows what this guy did. So it was on that side on that stretch of road. And that's where I dropped her off. She said she was going to go wait for her friends. She was going to go find them and hang out and wait for her friends. And I asked if that was going to be okay. She said, yeah, it's fine. Um, kids get dropped off early enough as it is. So it's not totally unusual for that to happen. It's just not usually that early that I drop her off. I mm-hmm. do school runs every once in a while for her. Um, I said, okay. Let her out. Have a good day. Love you. Thanks. Love you, too. And I turned around and was driving away and was watching her in my rearview mirror to make sure that she was going where she was supposed to go. And she was moving in that direction, but she was rummaging around in her backpack or something. What I assumed was probably headphones or something like that. But I found out later that she forgot her phone here, so she may have been rummaging for her phone. Um, but she was still kind of making her way towards, towards that direction, so it looked okay. It looked like any other day. And I just continued on. Okay. When you said you dropped her off, like, in the area, kind of, like, where exactly did you drop her off? So, if you pull down the street going towards the school, Mm -hmm. um, you've got that whole strip of communities on the right side there. Mm -hmm. It was in that stretch of sidewalk there. We pulled in and maybe maybe about halfway up the street or so, and she was like, right here is good. Was it, like, in one of the apartment complexes, the church? Not in. It was outside one of the apartment. It was just on the sidewalk on the side of the road there. Just... Like a tuck and roll, you know? Okay, so like if I were to be on the road, where, With the maps like, on. what do you remember seeing that you dropped her off at? I remember the, the overpass is up ahead. All right, so we give some bullshit story. Mm-hmm. Um, but to speed this up because we're running out of time. Um, I want to, first of all, um, he gives his explanation about the phone reset. Do you remember when he reset his phone? He hands his phone to um, law enforcement, but tells him the day before, oh, I don't know what I did. There was like a factory. Um, there, there was like this big update and I updated it and somehow I factory reset my phone. It was an accident. I don't know what to tell you. Um, but this is his explanation of that. Here we go. I don't know what the heck I did, but somehow during the massive OS update, I managed to factory reset my phone and lose all of my contacts, all my information. Mm-hmm. What time was that? Do you remember? 
how sometime while I was hanging out with Jen, Jen might know, I looked at her and said, what, what did I just do? Okay. Um, she might know better. I don't know what time it was. It was when I was here with Jen. By the way, isn't that like always the answer? It's like, oh, I don't know. I, I just, I don't remember what I did. They just so overly complicate these things. It's like, um, there's this scene in Breaking Bad where um, Walt is trying to justify why he got like some wayward um, phone call late at night. And it's like, oh, you know what that must have been? That must have been like an alarm that is set from a medication. But I don't know what I did. They so overly complicate these things. And, but it turns out that Walt, Walter White is like this genius level biochemist that makes the purest meth that's ever been known on the face of Earth. And, you know, he's trying to explain to his wife that this genius level person has no idea how to work a cell phone. Um, it just every time people say stuff like that, there's, there's some, something's up, man. Come on. I'm not the most tech savvy guy, but I know how to not factory reset my phone. You know what I mean? Because there's like eight different alarm bells that go off before you that actually lets you to do it. You know. Anyway. Okay. I don't think I have any other questions. Uh, do you? Liz? I don't know where my head was yesterday. It was so far up my backside. And he keeps saying stuff like that. Oh, I don't know. I was so sleep deprived. Oh. It was so early in the morning. My head was up my ass. He keeps saying stuff like that to justify why he can't remember specific details of the case. Which, if I were to wake up randomly at 3.30 a.m. and oh. I was, like, forced to get to do a hearing, I promise you, um, I would not be so groggy as to not be able to do my court hearing. It just wouldn't happen. Wouldn't happen. Um, but I've spent my entire life sleep deprived. Uh, so maybe that's why. But just the, the way that he keeps on offering explanations for his lack of recall for his inability to remember very specific details um, is another telltale sign they knew this guy was full of shit from the very beginning mm -hmm. um, i know that i'm trying to keep this all to like motive and we're going to talk about this but i just want to get to this satisfying part where they just tell this guy that he's full of shit and i think he knows at this point he's going to jail it's okay we understand um in the meantime while we're waiting for all this to get sorted out I am going to hold on to your phone, okay? Um, I'll give it back. I'm back on the... All right, so this is where they start questioning him, really grilling him. At this point, they've checked his Google Maps. Um, they know exactly where he has been and hasn't been. They know exact times. Mm -hmm. And so now they're just pressing him for the details. Let me tell you something. If you're ever arrested and they're asking you the same question in different ways, they got something on you, buddy. Mm -hmm. They got something on you. You do well to... Sh STFU and call an attorney because you're you're cooked. What they're trying to do is get you to make incriminating statements that don't jive with uh -huh. tangible facts that they know they're going to be able to use at trial. So when they keep on answering, asking the same question, and you know, I mean, I might be helping criminals out when I say this. I'm just saying that when they keep asking you the same question more than once, you fall back on your first answer. Or your first answer, you just simply say, "Look, I've already answered that question. Do you want me to say it again? Mm -hmm. You already asked me that. You already, you know what? I'm done answering that question unless you got something else for me. That's the only response other than call my lawyer. <laughs> um, just a, a public service announcement from the Tilted Lawyer. Good morning, Mission. Okay. The camera has you in the complex for 12 minutes. Mm -hmm. Does that seem about right? Yeah, coming into the complex, driving around, parking, getting the fob, coming back out. Sounds about right. Okay. And then you leave. What time would you say you dropped her off at the school? <laughs> or not at the school, but in the area? My estimate was sometime between 820 and 840. Um, okay, you, the camera has you leaving the complex at 831. 831, okay, so it must have been closer to 840 then. Okay, and then after you dropped her off, did you go directly to the smoke shop? I did, I went directly to the smoke shop, um, waited, it was supposed to be open, but it wasn't. Um, I waited a little while to see if they were just being slow about turning on the open sign. They weren't, so I went home at that point. How long do you think you waited? <clears throat> Five, ten minutes, maybe. Okay, so if you drop her off at, like, 840, how far is a smoke shop from there to 
where you dropped her off? I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how how many minutes how far. Did you go anywhere else after the smoke shop? Um, I guess here's the caveat, man. Like they know they know that this guy's cooked as far as evidence. Um, if he were to shut down right now and just say I need my lawyer, um, he's gonna be suspect number one. Prime. If, I mean, he's already suspect number one, but they're going to really get, you know, aroused by the thought of going after this guy when he shuts down and says, you know what? I think I need an attorney if you're going to keep asking me these questions mm -hmm. because then they're really going to fixate on him. And and so, you know, I could tell you all this advice, but if you did it and they got the evidence, you're cooked, man. I don't know what to tell you. Um, don't commit crimes. Don't kill 13 year old little girls. Don't sexually <laughs> people. And you'll, you'll, you'll do well to do that. And you'll you'll keep your freedom. I don't know. I don't think I went anywhere specific. I was just driving probably in the direction of home. But I don't remember stopping anywhere specifically. And you were there for five to ten minutes? Roundabout, I think. Okay, so like let's say you drop her off at 8.40. We don't see her car coming back south until 10 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. So what are you doing between 8.40 and 10 o'clock? Um, cruising around a little bit. Uh, okay, but I asked you earlier, you know, like what you were doing, and yeah. you said you were there for like 5 or 10 minutes, and then you came back home. Yeah, well, I went to the smoke shop, like I said. Um, but I was probably, I may have been meandering around the area, but I made my way home. Okay, but I'm asking you earlier, right? And even like the first time we talked to you, you're not telling us that you're like, you know, just cruising the area, like you're coming home. So I need to be able to explain to my supervisors why there's such a time gap. I mean, I don't, I don't know what to say. It was just a normal day. I didn't have anything important to do. The way when law enforcement starts saying, I need to explain my to my supervisors about why your story is full of shit yeah. you're, you're going to jail man i don't know what to tell you you're going to jail the smoke shop was supposed to open soon so i made my way over there it wasn't any particular rush though okay but can you help me explain to them because i don't know the explanation or the answer to this question okay so can you help me explain to them why there's such a delay Hey, Pam, uh, to answer your question, maybe. How would you craft a wrongful death lawsuit with respect? Um, I'd imagine it would be as to Jen Soto. If she's not charged criminally, is there a world where we can craft a civil complaint revolving around wrongful death, failure to protect, child neglect, child endangerment, as to Jennifer Soto for her failure to keep her daughter safe um, leading to her death. Hmm. I'm just going to say unequivocally, yes. Um, I mean, I would, I would, I would just tell if someone would approach me like this, like, yeah, let's find a way. Um, I'd probably file the complaint and, and fill in the gaps later. That's what discovering depositions are for. Um, I would draft the complaint and it would read something like this. Uh, Jennifer Soto was the biological mother of Madeline Soto. She was 13, who was 13 years old. Uh, she had a boyfriend, um, who was, in and out of the house for a period of years. It was unequivocally, who unequivocally abused her in, in the most heinous of scenarios for a period of years leading ultimately to her death. Jennifer Soto had reason to believe and a reasonable person would have known uh, that she was in danger and would have taken measures to protect her daughter. Rather than doing that, Jennifer Soto, instead of protecting her daughter, sent her abuser to go sleep in the same bed with her that ultimately culminated in her death. She's responsible for her death for failure to protect and all these other things. We're seeking punitive damages, among other things. Um, that would be the framework of my complaint, and I would build it from there. What do you think? Do you co-sign? Do you con Counselor, do you concur? I do. <laughs> That's a great question, Pam. Thank you for that. Oh, let's continue with this. I'm about to wrap up because I have other questions to ask you, Eliana. Okay. In the time. No, can't explain it. I wasn't going anywhere in particular. I wasn't doing anything in particular. Just making my way to the smoke shop. Waited for them to open. They did not open. And then I left. 
Where did you go from there? From the smoke shop, mm -hmm. I went home. Okay, the smoke shop is like 10 minutes from here, right? 15, 20 ish, 15, 20 ish, something like that. Earlier, you told us it was 10 minutes. The time is not a strong suit of mine. I'm, I'm guesstimating here. I'm I understand, but I have to be able to. I can't. I, I can't. <laughs> Uh, time is not a strong suit of mine. I don't know what to do. Time is a mystery to me. Uh, forget my inability to craft a story that makes sense. F this guy, man. Just give him the freaking chair already. I would, you know, um, I, I for this guy, I would, I would legislate that we should bring back medieval tortures. What do you think about that? Let's put him on the. Let's put him on the rack. Please. Let's institute <laughs> flogging. Um, I'm I'm good with uh, dipping him in in honey. And sticking the fire ants on him, <laughs> Iceman style. Oh God! This guy deserves whatever is coming. I don't think he's gonna make it to the death penalty. I think if they let this guy ever out for a period of time, he's gone. Hawk Two is in the house. She says hi, y'all. <laughs> it's made us. The meme has made its way into the chat. And um, what's up, Amanda McClure? Uh, Bill says that she allowed and encouraged it sadly enough yeah all right so look um stearns is cooked uh there there's not a scenario where he's going to get out of what's coming no i don't think the da is of the mind to make plea deals in this case i think they want the death penalty that little girl deserved better than what she got and he took her life because he was jealous of some seventh or eighth graders that she might have had a crush on if I'm the DA in this case, uh, my look, you could get him for first degree in a couple of ways. This was a death that happened in the commission of a felony. That's the easy statutory part. But more importantly, for death penalty purposes, this was a premeditated, calculated um, murder designed to cover his ass in the event that she would ever, as an adult, implicate him in crimes of the horrific nature of which he committed. For one. Number two, um, as a result of his adolescent underdeveloped brain uh, <laughs> allowing him to be jealous of a 13 year old who might have had crushes on other 13 year olds it's called it started you know some time ago when she was seven or eight years old and culminating in what we know now to have ended in the strangulation of madeline soto this was a guy uh who was sick and deranged to a level that he's capable of doing such things he doesn't deserve to walk amongst us. He doesn't deserve to breathe our oxygen. No. He doesn't deserve any of the comforts that might compel him to experience comfort on death row. He doesn't deserve a last meal. He deserves to be uh, jailed and celled up with other inmates of the proclivity to swing that way who will do to him and make him feel as scared as Madeline felt for all of those years as he was torturing and abusing and assaulting her. F that guy forever. I would move to propose a 27th Amendment to allow for medieval tortures to befall those that have committed the heinous acts that Mr. Stearns has committed. And anything that's within the gravity of those allegations. What do you think of that? That's good. <laughs> Do you, do you co-sign or are we going to co-sign? Yes. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about something a little more uh, sensitive. So mm -hmm. listen, we deal with these cases. We're often charged with trying to protect these children. If you were to get a case, if you were to get a case dealing with the allegations that befell Madeline Soto, um, this case would come across your desk and one of the things that you might do is subpoena teachers and other mandatory reporters as to what signs they might have seen mm -hmm. um, which would have compelled them to report this case to cps or somebody else or law enforcement or whatever mm -hmm. um, because at this point mom didn't see the signs okay did anybody else see the signs like what did we know and you might be surprised to know that they did there wasn't much man there just wasn't a whole lot um, here, her teachers describe it. Mm -hmm. There's a series of interviews. I'm not going to go through all of them, but what is frustrating to me as a litigator, I, I got to tell you, there, there's nothing that terrifies me more 
than litigating a case at trial involving children and the testimony of children. I don't like it. It doesn't feel good. I never know if the parents have coached the child to say certain things. I never know if the child is afraid to say certain things. And it just always frustrates me when the court will ignore all of these obvious red flags mm -hmm. and say, oh, well, she said she never said anything that, that like that happened. Maybe because she was fucking 12 years old mm -hmm. and, you know, deathly afraid of this guy because he was always there. This is what the teachers knew about her situation. I'm going to play this. I got to share my screen, don't I? Yeah. All right. Here we go. School grades um, and then some mental health concerns in terms of a lot of anxiety and panic attacks. So from there, I have been doing ongoing check-ins with um, her throughout the school year thus far. Mm -hmm. I think we've met about, I was looking at it earlier, six times. Okay. Since the beginning of the school year? Correct. Got it. Okay. Um, when she has come to me, it's often been uh, those feelings of panic. Um, she's come to me like in the middle of class or during lunchtime, just feeling really panicked, um, kind of heavy breathing, feeling really overwhelmed. Um, and when we've had our conversation. So the person speaking is one of um, Madeline's teachers. Uh -huh. um, and she's just describing how she observed her while she was in her class conversations about well, what's going on what's making you feel this way i've gotten responses saying well it's my anxiety sometimes i don't know i'm just really overstimulated with all the noise in the cafeteria but i've also gotten responses with um well things at home with her and when i pressed about that it seemed to be things along the lines of well she gets upset that i'm forgetful or that i don't clean my room the way she wants me to and we talked about what that does to affect her. And she mm -hmm. says, yelling, that makes me get overstimulated. And then I can't respond to her in a way that she wants me to. So Madeline using this language that she gets overstimulated is the result of her being told what her symptoms of ADHD are. Mm -hmm. And that's what she's supposed to say, because that's what everybody else is telling her is happening when she's feeling bad about herself. She's overstimulated. As if she was like in the 1950s and needed to be lobotomized because she couldn't behave herself. As if this was like 1915 and you know what, maybe you just need to calm down. Maybe you need a, a cocaine drop or whatever, as was prevalent in the 1900s, 1910s, whatever. Um, she is repeating stuff that has been told to her to explain away the bad feelings that she feels from all the abuse. And her telling her teacher that she was overstimulated to me is red flag number one. I don't know. Did you catch the same thing, Eliana? Yeah, I was the whole time. I was like, "Why is she using all this language that usually a teenager doesn't use?" Like the because she's been told that over and over by her mom and probably Stearns. Yeah. How many times does Stearns mention bring up her ADHD and she's probably autistic and all of this? And so she's hearing that constantly. It's her only frame of reference. She has a limited vocabulary because she's thirteen, and so. The fact that she's repeating this to teachers to explain away the depression and bad feelings and uh -huh. perhaps her being scared uh, is a means to justify, or that's what that's called. You feeling that means you're overstimulated because of your uh -huh. ADHD. Um, to me, if I'm, if I'm thinking, if I have my lawyer hat on and I'm looking for red flags that maybe perhaps people might have picked up on, uh -huh. that's like an obvious one. The fact that she's using clinical language to describe mm -hmm. her um, mental state to anybody should be a red flag. But you've litigated these cases just as much as I have. <laughs> How often do you introduce a testimony like that and have it stick? Oh, <laughs> the judge is going to be the first one is going to be like, this is not coming from the child. <laughs> like somebody's telling her what to say. <laughs> Well, they might say that, or they might not. They might just go along with this, like, meh. Mm. Some judges are sharper than others, is all I'm going to say. You know, yeah. you might have a judge that just glosses right over that. The good ones will question it. Um, of course. Of course. 
Um, but of course, you're going to have the other attorney, and this is the other attorney. They're going to be like, well, look, she had every opportunity to tell anybody anything that was going on, and all she could think of was, oh, she don't like this guy because he eats up all the food. Huh. And, you know, the absence of an allegation of sexual impropriety on the part of a minor child should be evidence that it didn't happen and that for therefore these allegations should just go away as in um, perhaps the other parent is alienating the father making this girl um, or making up these allegations making this girl uh, I don't know say whatever they might try to to dismiss it as that but let's continue with this interview so we discussed strategies for kind of calming herself down and talking. She's calm about how that makes her feel. Mm-hmm. And she reported to me that she did have that conversation for our past check-in since December. So December, January, February, we had a check-in every single month. And each of those check-ins, she had said to me, things are better at home and things are a little bit better at school. And I haven't had her come to me in months with any sort of panic. That's her biological dad right there, by the way. Or anxiety. I did have her mention on occasion her home situation at that time was when I asked her about that. The only thing she really said was, "Mm, I don't really like him. He's kind of weird. So I said, okay, well, what does that mean? How is he weird? Why don't you like him? And her responses were nothing of that level of concern it was always well he eats all of our food and he hangs out in the living room and it makes me uncomfortable because i don't really like him so i don't want him to be there but nothing ever to the level of concern that we're seeing now Mm -hmm. and the last thing i heard about him was he's moving out i'm happy about that and that's helping me feel better with I'll tell you what. So like in some of these custody cases, you'll hear child children say these kinds of things that I don't really like him. I don't like when he's around. He's in the living room all the time. He eats up all the food and I just don't, you know, I'm happy that he's moving out. They'll say stuff like that. And there will be a request from one of the parents to keep this effing guy away from my child. And the judge will ask like, for what, you know, what did he do? And then if they were to rely solely on the statements of this minor child, um, they that would not strike a judge without more as anything more than you know some adolescent um vitriol towards perhaps a stepdad that most kids go through at some point but that wouldn't scream this child is in danger you know so if even if mom was trying to get like a restraining order from this guy because of the abuse or whatever um without if that if those were the allegations or let's say the allegations were uh, sexual abuse, child abuse, and all of that. And then the interview, during the interview, CPS, she denies it and just says that kind of stuff. Um, those charges aren't going to stick. Exactly. You're not going to get a stay away order. You might, you might not even get a restraining order on, on the strength of that. I will say this, um, that none of these teachers asked her point blank if she was being sexually abused. Mm-hmm. So there's that. So that we're, we're relying on whether or not Madeline would have been brave enough bring this up to teachers when prompted Mm -hmm. which if she's been groomed from the age of seven um i don't know of any 13 year olds that would have just went straight to that no and so i don't don't know man Uh, let me continue with this when was that conversation that he was moving out that was about a couple of months ago so i would say around december okay so sometime in december you guys had a meeting and she said Okay, got it. Did she ever mention anything to you about having depression or like suicidal thoughts or any suicidal attempts or anything like that? She never mentioned anything along those lines. It was always more so focused on the anxiety and the panic. Okay. And a lot of times she wasn't able to verbally articulate what exactly was making that panic arise beyond feeling overstimulated. What do you think the what do you think about the anxiety and panic not being fully investigated? Most seven year olds, well, most 13 year olds just aren't so overcome with anxiety and panic to have it become a thing. Like the anxiety I understand, but then the panic attacks, that's a little bit more That's a little bit of a red flag, isn't it? Yes, like I I mean, was she in therapy? Was somebody taking care of all of this? Um, I mean, I feel like she's having these anxiety and panic attacks and being told, oh, it's just your ADHD. 
Oh. So they're mind controlling this little girl to whenever she feels certain things that you're, look, it's because of this. It's not because of what's happening to you. It's because you have a condition. Take mm-hmm. your meds. I don't know. What do you think? I think it should have been investigated, at least the panic attacks. Uh, It's just, I don't know. I mean, I know a lot of teenagers have anxiety. It's just not that common, at least to my knowledge, uh, that kids that age are having constant like panic attacks. There's something must be causing those panic attacks. And usually it's not just, I mean, from what I know, just ADHD, like something is The, the the panic attacks is a huge tell to me, man. I mean, 13-year-olds just don't have panic attacks for no reason. Mm-hmm. By the way, look at this picture of her with her dad. <laughs> I mean, that's just such a great picture. I don't know who this lady is. This is her dad. I mean, could you imagine a world where this guy is trying to get custody of his daughter. I don't know if that's the case. I'm completely spec. I've just seen cases where you have loving fathers that just want to be part of their, their child's lives. And they, you know, I mean, he's the apple of her eye, man. Look at this guy. He loves his daughter. There's no chance. He can look at that picture and not think of that. And in the meantime, you know, you got Jen Soto over here with dipshit Stearns. And, um, you know, I could, I've seen cases where they vilify this guy Mm-hmm. Um, and say that always oh, a deadbeat, always oh, this and that, always oh, you know whatever. He's got substance abuse. He drinks alcohol, and they try to limit contact. In the meantime, she's being everything is happening to her. Um, you know, Amanda says, if it was a father that had custody of his daughter and made the same choice as a Jen, mm-hmm. he would have been object. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um. All right, I'm going to go a little bit more with this. We're just not knowing. Okay, so she never mentioned to you about wanting to hurt herself, wanting to die, wanting to, um, nothing like that. She never mentioned wanting to harm herself or wanting to die. She made comments in the interactions where she was feeling panicky, saying things more so like, you know, this, this hurts and I don't, like this or want to deal with this but it was never anything like i want to hurt myself or end my life or anything along those lines gotcha okay and she didn't disclose that she was taking medication for anything other than just the anxiety or for the adhd and the anxiety i didn't talk to her specifically about medication and i can't recall what was said it would be in the esc meeting notes if it was discussed that okay she was or wasn't on medication and she has an iep you said correct Correct. so she switched for the 504 to the iep Gotcha. Cool. Okay. Did she mention anything? Um, about just didn't like him because he ate their food and he was in their living room. Like, did she say anything else to you? Disclose anything to you? She did not. She didn't talk about. Asked her about those comments of him being weird and uncomfortable. The only thing she gave me were, well, I don't know. He's just a little weird. He eats our food and he's always hanging out in the living room and I don't really want to be around him and nothing. And the way she said it was so like joking uh-huh. in terms of, like, I don't know, he's weird type situation, like laughing about it. It never made me feel like there was a safety okay. concern. Okay. So she didn't disclose anything about him ever touching her inappropriately or them having any sort of a sexual relationship or them having any sort of an inappropriate relationship whatsoever. None of that was ever disclosed or or anything brought up to you. Okay. Let me check and see. There's, like I said, there's some other questions that I have to ask and I just want to make sure that I touch. Jesus. There's a, there's more, um, there's more interviews. There's a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's like seven different. Um, None of them mention anything about Madeline saying anything and so the challenge is lawyers as we have these cases and oftentimes we're we're presented with these cases where abuse is alleged Mm -hmm. and then the judges and opposing counsel is like well why don't we just bring the kid in my objection to the judge has always been your honor i don't want to have this child interviewed in open court Mm -hmm. when abuser dad is staring down her soul 
in front of both of her parents. I try to get make provisions for the child to testify like in chambers. Yes. Um, without so many scary people around and, you know, fi- try to find a way. But even that's just not reliable, man. I've only had one judge refuse to do that, citing, uh, well, dad has a right to confront his accuser. Like, I bro. had one judge allow only the child in the courtroom and yeah. make everybody, including attorneys, parties, leave the courtroom and they were given a phone number to be able to listen to the testimony. Yep. But they I could not know. there. So I think we know the judge. She does that. The judge clerk. Mm-hmm. Um no it was a guardianship case. Um it was the judge, oh. the clerk and the child. And mm-hmm. that was it. But there were some allegations about abuse. So that's yeah. why we wanted to make sure um she testified. But so I that's mean, a move. But as you can imagine though, like even if okay, let's say you get a perfect environment for the child. Let's say that, you, okay, we're going to take the child in, you know, to judge's chambers. They're not going to even go through the courtroom. They'll go through the side door. Um, and then we'll just put her on speakerphone so everybody in the courtroom can hear what's going on. Uh-huh. There's like a pre-selected questions that she's going to uh-huh. be asked. And then, and then we, we do it that way. How confident are you that the kid is going to say what actually happened? I got to tell you, I have... Gosh, I've been in a, an, an attorney for 11 years now. Mm-hmm. I've had to examine, I don't know how many children. It's probably close to 100. I've never felt comfortable interviewing children. To mm-hmm. this day, I don't feel like I have experience interviewing children where I just know what's going to happen. It's just always been this wild card. They might say what happened. They might say what, what didn't happen. They might say what they've been coached to say. They mm-hmm. might uh, just be shy to say what's actually going on. It's always this big fucking mystery, man. Um, I I- tell you, oh, yeah, you can interview my child like for the, for the mediator to interview the child. I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure what you're going to say. I'm like, never, never be sure. So many times clients have told me this is what the child is going to say. And in mediation, they say the complete opposite because a lot of times they're telling the parent what they want to hear. But when they're placed there in the situation where there's a third party, they'll just randomly choose one side, even if it's not the truth. Could you just imagine a world, just just imagine, where you're trying to, to, to get these answers out of children? And they don't want it. They love their mom. Mm-hmm. They love their dad. And even if they're being treated badly by one or the other or both, mm-hmm. um, the only world that they know, their universe is confined to the four corners of their immediate family for the most part. Mm-hmm. Dad, he might be a piece of shit, but he's their but he's dad. Mom mm-hmm. might be endangering the child, uh, but she's mom. And ultimately, mm-hmm. they live with these people. Even if, you know, we limit contact with an abusive parent, there's still going to be some, some contact with the parent, and they're still going to have to try to cultivate a relationship with their parent. Uh-huh. And that's always going to protect their parents, uh, perhaps unnecessarily. Um, Haktua said something. Uh, she said, uh, do you believe that J.S. endangered Maddie? Yeah, I do. Uh-huh. I believe that Jen Soto should be in jail. I believe that she should be facing multiple years in state prison for her inability to protect her child and for what, more importantly, putting her child in harm's way, 100%. Um, I'm not convinced that she's not going to be charged with anything. She might not be charged with anything now, but I think that down the road, um, you may see um, her get charged with something. Um, Leah says that Stephen talked about Maddie's crush. And was Stephen crushed by hearing? Yeah, I think he was. I think he was jealous like a 12-year-old boy. Um, Jennifer says, uh, may, I, may I just say that when you ask children this young about sex, they may not even understand what it actually means. It's exactly right. It's exactly right. You, you can talk over a child's head without them knowing it. Mm-hmm. And they're not going to admit to you that, that you're talking over their head. And so you have to be very skilled. And gosh, man, um, I hate so much when I have to question children in court. I've had, I never know when they're telling the truth or not. I've had children literally say in to, to cops that they witnessed their dad pulling their mom by the hair and punching her in the face and forcing her to walk home with a bloody chin lip or whatever. And then when she gets in front of the judge, she's like, Oh no, none, none of that happened. They just oh, got wow. mad at each other. And then it was it, you know, 
<laughs> so what do you do with that? And if you're if you're the judge and they're so hell bent on saying, oh, the veracity of witnesses are going to carry weight or whatever, and well, she said that it didn't happen. Um, you know, you're you're forcing, you're relying, and you're hoping that the judges are experienced and discerning enough to be able to know the difference between a child that's actually telling the truth and a child that's trying to protect their parents, no matter how reprehensible they might be. And uh, oftentimes those things don't all coalesce at the same time. And so the only reason I bring this up is because this is an issue. Jennifer Madeline Soto was a child that was severely abused for a period of years in ways that you could not comprehend in horrific ways that she didn't deserve. It ended in, in it culminated with the ending of her life. Um, and there wasn't a whole lot of signs for a lay person to sit there and discern what was going on. So my only exercise in trying to, to go through some of these interviews is what did these people miss? And to me, it was the, the, the presence of panic attacks. You're not going to have a panic attack because mom's boyfriend has eaten up all the food. No. You're not having a panic attack because dad is a little bit weird. Mm -hmm. You're having panic attacks because Stearns was performing horrific acts of abuse towards this little girl that she didn't deserve. And somebody should have picked up on it. And perhaps, and I say that because, you know, I'm skeptical that that would have even made a difference because let's just say that we reported to CPS. She would have told the same things to CPS. Mm -hmm. And then they would have said, oh, well, I don't know. These allegations are unfounded. Or they might have said inconclusive. And nothing would have happened. These cases are extremely complex. They're extremely heartbreaking to litigate every single time. Cool. There's not a lot of answers for how to do it. And oftentimes the people that are handling these cases are severely unqualified to know mm -hmm. what they're lis listening to or seeing. Mm -hmm. And so that's where we have, listen, I'm not, I'm not finished with this case by any measure. We're going to keep on following this case. I want this guy. Um, if my show has any influence, which it doesn't, but if it did have any influence, I want this guy to die for what he did. Full stop. Unequivocally, this guy deserved what's coming to him. And if should if should some form of prison um, justice befall him in his last days, then, you know, well, shit happens, I guess. What are you going to do? <laughs> all right. Well, that's all we have for today for the Soto case. Um, do you have anything to add, Ileana? Just women, men, it doesn't matter. Just be very careful who you introduce to your children. <laughs> like, I have one more thing to add. I do. Be ex exactly what you just said, Leon. Hey, Dominic, could you jump on real quick? Yeah. I asked you to do a social experiment. I wanted you to like go into a, a chat room with... Uh, I don't know, a teenage chat room and say that you were like a 13 year old girl and see how many people DM'd you. So you did that exercise. Tell me what happened. Uh, no, I didn't. I wasn't able to do it because, uh, God damn it. A chat room. Okay, so <laughs> there, was, there, there, there was a, I, I saw another podcast and it was literally this guy posed as a 13 year old girl. And, um, he was on there for like maybe 30 seconds and like 18 different people had DM'd him. And we're saying all these sexually explicit things and all these other stuff um, within like a minute. Your children are not safe. Your 13 year old girls are not safe. Your teenagers are not safe. Your children are not safe. You have an ultimate duty to protect your children at all costs from those that might be close to you, from your boyfriends, from your husband, uh -huh. from your siblings, from your uncles, from whoever. Your children are never safe. You have to keep an eye on your children because this little girl didn't deserve what she got. And if you're not protecting your children actively, monitoring what they do, activity-wise, online, um, in public, um, involved with their school, all of these other things, then you are guilty of failing to protect your child and perhaps endangering your child because of your failure to protect. And ultimately, the worst case scenario is what happened to Madeline. Keep an eye on your children. 
just because you've known this guy for 10, 15 years doesn't mean that he doesn't have some kind of weird sexual CP fantasy mm-hmm. that he might be trying to um, include your child in the middle of it, boy or girl. Mm-hmm. Boy or girl. Keep your children safe, folks. I'm sick and tired of seeing these cases. I litigate these cases all the time. I'm sick of them. I'm sick of them. It's bad for your soul. It's bad for your spirits. It's, um, I can't with these cases anymore, man. We're going to stick on this case. I want to make sure, not that I can make sure of anything. I want this guy, if there's anything we can do, I want to ensure that justice happens here. So we're going to keep on covering this case. I want you guys, if you haven't already done so, um, not only subscribe to this show and this channel, because we're going to be, um, deeply involved in the coverage of this case, but I want you to go subscribe to Grizzly True Crimes, who is, she truly is the best in the business when it comes to these true crimes cases. She is aces when it comes to gathering actual evidence for these cases. Um, FOIA requests, she spends her own money and resources and in accumulating these things. Uh, Go follow her channel. She's an amazing uh, content maker. She's an amazing YouTuber, amazing um, whatever you want to call her. She's don't take my word for it, man. Go subscribe to her channel. Um, don't forget about our YouTube memberships. If you haven't uh, made your way over there already, it costs like $3 a month and you get access to all kinds of extra content. Um, if you haven't already done so, if you're a subscriber to our Patreon, you have access to our entire catalog of pad, uh, podcasts dating all the way back to 22. If you're only listening on the YouTube channel, you only have access to so much. Dominic has put up our historical catalog on the Patreon for everybody to, to review. Um, hey, Dominic, you have any anything else to add to any of that? Uh, yeah, if you guys enjoy Omar's podcast, make sure to go over to uh, Apple Podcasts and, and uh, give it a good review. Uh, because Apple Podcasts push, you know, podcasts that have good reviews to bigger audiences. Um, so that helps out the show a sure. lot. Yeah, go, that, you know, uh, to Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts, make sure you listen to us. Some of y'all listen to us like when you're at the gym. I just sounded very Southern right there. Some of y'all, um, <laughs> whenever whenever you guys go in, you know, I listen to podcasts at the gym all the time, you know, when I'm just in my man cave hanging out playing Madden or whatever. Um, we're on all of the podcast carriers in existence. Go into podcast, uh, wherever it is, drop a review, um, leave us a like, subscribe to our show, and you can catch us that way. And that will never be behind a paywall. You can do that whenever you want, completely free of charge. Um, so for all you folks, we're going to do Family Law After Dark in about five minutes or so. Give us about five minutes. Ileana, although she's very busy, and and shout out to Ileana for covering for me for a very big case. Hey, it's the uterus. What's up, Marty? She's a she's a YouTube member. She's she's paying for a YouTube membership with my own money. <laughs> um but she's in she's in here. Um Moira says, uh, Omar, would you would you like there to an amalgamation of professional teams get together to be so trained together to be trained so children can get yes, I would like to do that. I think that we have to update the way that we litigate these cases involving children because I feel like these children, there's so many children out there that are in danger. They can't fend for themselves. They need protection and the way that we litigate these cases, we're just so selling them short with what is out there right now we don't have the means to litigate these cases properly in a way i'm not certain if madeline soto would have went to cps and filed a complaint that anything would have happened that's how little faith i have in in the the current mechanisms we have to protect children nowadays and so by all means if there's a way to do that if we could promote awareness amongst these children and a way to keep them more safe then I'm all for that. If there's anything that my show can do uh, to team up with anybody else to make that happen then I'm all for that. And so in closing folks, um, thank you guys so much for listening. We're going to do Family Law After Dark give us about 5 minutes to reset. Ileana's going to be joining us. Um and again, shout out for her. I know I mentioned to you guys that I've been kind of incognito for, I don't even know if that's the right word, but I've been absent for like the last week. I've been dealing with funeral services and stuff. Ileana covered for me on a really big case and I'm uh, eternally grateful for and did a great job doing it. Um, she's going to be joining us on Family Law After Dark, which is a, a rare treat because she's like, uh, she's only on like maybe half of them, but she's going to be joining us today. We have some user submissions. We got some Reddit trolling that we're going to be doing. Um, but you're not going to want to miss that. So 
Um, if you want to join us on the live, just go to my channel. Maybe Dominic could link to the FLAD link. And we're going to be just starting up there in about five minutes. I love you all. And uh, we will see you all uh, later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.